In less than two months, voters in Taiwan will flock to the polls again for the 9-in-1 midterm elections on November 26. Mayors of the six municipalities, county commissioners, city councilors to borough chief are up for grabs this election. Hi everyone and welcome to the program Taiwan Talks covering the latest global news and analysts from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Gladys Lee. I'm Rath Wang. And today we're happy to have two opinion leaders to join with us. First, we would like to introduce you the Democratic Progressive Party DPP legislator Luo Zhizhou, also convener of the Foreign and National Defense Committee, also serves as DPP's International Affairs Director. His counterpart today, we have Mr. Alexander Huang, the Kuomintang KMT's International Affairs Director, former Director of the Political Affairs Division at the Taiwan Representative Office in the U.S., also Professor Tutankhan University. Welcome. I'm very glad to have you two both here in the studio with us. And today, Rath, you have some news to share with us. You've just been back to the U.S. Correct. I spoke earlier to both DPP and KMT mission leads of Taiwan's two main political parties in Washington, D.C. on the global implications of this upcoming election. True, and we have more to come on the program later. So first of all, we'd love to talk about the 9-in-1 election in Taiwan. Actually, traditionally speaking, these elections are seen as the referendum on the ruling parties, and the opposition parties tend to pick up traction. We saw this happen in 2018. That was when President Tsai Ing-wen's rating dropped between 20% to 30%. However, this year could be tricky, because right now we see President's approval rate are over 50% after six years in office. The, I want to ask you is, the KMT has an incumbency advantage of 14 out of 22 cities, municipalities. How do you think the KMT will fare in this November election? I, I think uh, the goal that we set is to at least maintain the current seats yeah. of 14. And uh, the chairman uh, had a, another bold promise that uh, he wanted to add one or two. Uh, and we see that as a victory. Uh, if we can uh, win more than 14 seats uh, in the local government. Uh, and, uh, you know, because uh, we still have, uh, you know, like uh, 60 days to go. Um, you know, for people who understand Taiwan's election, you know, the most critical moment would be the very last week that when people may be affected by a, a news or an event. Um, but we think that we are looking fairly okay uh, this year, and uh, we hope that we can uh, preserve the momentum and uh, carry that all the way to November 26. I see. And actually, if we really uh, examine the differences between the voters to KMT and DPP, we can feel the difference in their natures, right? Correct me if I was wrong, but we can see the voters for KMT, they vote out of their, of course, a favor for the party, but also for the favor of the resentment of DPP. On the contrary, the voters for DPP, they vote for the party out of their loyalty, their passion. So that would be the nature difference of the two voters. For legislator, how would you see how confident for the party this year? Well, first of all, we have to understand that these elections are local elections. Yes. It's not a national election, although it's a nationwide election. But the nature of the elections are local elections. So in some way, that reflects uh, our local performances, especially uh, for the incumbent. Uh, mayors and county commissioners and so on. And uh, we have to understand that Taiwan, uh, in the past few years, KMT uh, controls the majority at the local level, but the DPP controls the majority at the central government level. Yes. So we have this kind of balance of power in Taiwan politics. So for us, we are hoping that we can get more seats, uh, uh, given the current number of seats we have. Uh, but we are hopeful that we can uh, make some progress by getting one or two more seats. Okay. Obviously, uh, it's kind of uh, uphill battle for us because it's you call it midterm election for us. Right. So although the nature of relations of the local elections are local, but the thing is, it's also a midterm election for our performance at the central government level. Mm -hmm. So we have to work hard, but I'm very confident that given the performance of the government at the central government level, that our progress in terms of economic performance, our fighting against uh, COVID-19 yeah. are, are quite impressive. So we deserve some credits for doing that well 
uh, in that regard. So we are hopeful that we can uh, give the voter confidence uh, given by the people to, to the ruling party. That's actually what we've talked about from the early of this show, that the vibes are different right now from 2018. So mm -hmm. do, can you feel any different uh, strategy changing within the party? Well, I think in 2018, the president's approval rating was below 40%, yeah. or even down to uh, 30%. Yeah. But even until now, the president's approval rating is about 50-something percent, mm -hmm. around 50%. So it's very, uh, it's unprecedented, I have to say it. You know, given uh, the president has now been serving his, her second term, mm -hmm. and there were two more years to go. So the approval rating was still very high, and we're hopeful this kind of uh, uh, high approval rating will become a very good and strong momentum in our favor. Okay. And for director, do you observe any winning strategy within the party, within your party this year? You know, I, I, I think uh, both uh, Chi Zheng and I were kind of training as a political scientist. You right. know, we have a special angle to look at, uh, you know, voting behavior right. and uh, elections. Um, what I felt a little bit different uh, within the KMT is that this time um, we try to nominate uh, more moderate, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, persons, uh, candidate. So you can, you won't see uh, a, a very extreme candidate that be nominated. Uh, is that in terms of? The China policy, or in terms of, uh, or um, or or whether we should uh, use a utmost strong, uh, you know, strength to to oppose or criticize the central government. Mm -hmm. We wanted to show the voters that these guys are nice guys. They are professionals. They they. We want to bring a a a piece of, you know, a kind of peace uh, and stable. Uh, you know, atmosphere to our localities mm. uh, and make, because Taiwan cannot be, uh, you know, in the uh, upheavals or in Mandarin Chinese or Zhetan too much. So, so we try to uh, provide uh, the voters and a different kind of KMT candidate, moderate, middle of the road, and uh, professionals and good governance. Uh, that, that's the focus for this el local election that we target on. Let me just add a point to that. Because the electoral system in Taiwan for the uh, city mayors and county commissioners are single member district. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's very uh, wise for all parties to nominate this kind of middle of road uh, candidate. Right. Because you have to win the majority to win the election. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, think, I think KMT's uh, nomination strategy is quite uh, Okay, in terms of nominating, nominating this kind of this kind of uh, moderate uh, candidates, but I'm very unfortunate to see that uh, in the past few weeks or month, we have we have been seeing this kind of negative campaigns, right? Uh, even uh, even character assassination, you know. So we are hopeful that uh, we can move uh, the agenda back to the uh, policy issues, and not just the uh, character. In, in terms of the negative campaigns, you mean on both sides? On you both sides, yeah. But uh, I think that's mm -hmm. not a good way. Uh, to develop uh, more moderate, mild uh, electoral cultures in Taiwan. Would you see if the people gets more reasonable, the voting rate would drop? Well, maybe. Well, we don't know. Would you worried about that? Uh, well, two reasons. Let, let yeah, me just say that first. Sure. First of all, uh, according to the, our previous experiences, the local elections, the voters turnout is always very low. Yes. You know, for the national election, presidential election, uh, at some point, our voters turn out reach to 80 percent. People got to vote, and then now it's about 70 something percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. But when we come, when it comes to uh, these local elections, it, it's about 60 something percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one factor that could influence the voters turn out this time is the uh, pandemic situation, because people may be reluctant mm -hmm. to come out and vote because they're concerns about this kind of COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, pandemic. So now we have to wait and see. Okay. And yeah, I agree. Uh, because local elections tended to have a lower, you know, voting right. rate uh, for sure. But when we in Taiwan say low voting rates, <laughs> still relatively would be high pretty high, high yeah. for most still of the democracy compared to the U.S. Yes, right. <laughs> especially yes. So, so actually, we we are pretty proud that uh, you know, in terms of uh, political participation that people wanted to get involved 
um, not necessarily being mobilized by political party, but people wanted to express their uh, preference, their, their choice. Um, and uh, also, depending on the candidate, because for local elections, you know, characters, personalities, and connections to local district uh, are also very uh, much a, a kind of big influence in people's voting behavior. Sure. What do you think would most motivate voters to come out? And you said local elections because of the lower turnout. Do you? Well, I think Chichen did more election. I, I have never uh, run for a public office. I would say, uh, you know, the candidates' connections, uh, uh, you know, uh, appearance, uh, approach to the uh, voters as one. The other is some critical local affairs or, or projects that people care most, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, uh, uh, senior care sure. or social uh, mm -hmm. welfare, mm -hmm. you know, housing issues. Things that affect their daily lives. Right, right. People would vote specifically for the issue that they care the most. And also, I think uh, characters, uh, candidates matter, because this time we have nine in one election. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, in some special municipalities, you have three in one, but in some counties, you have nine in one election, six in one election. So people vote for not just the mayors, uh, county commissioners, but they also vote for city, uh, uh, you know, Borough council chiefs, and, uh, chiefs right. township chiefs, and so on. So these candidates will try their best to mobilize their supporters right. to come out and vote, right. to vote. So you have different uh, ways to mobilize our voters. So that's the reason why, although we don't have this kind of mandatory voting, uh, but uh, you still have a very high voter turnout. Yes, and this year we can uh, observe some interesting things about the third party's power, right? Like in 2016, we have the new part party. Two years ago, we have the uh, Taiwan People's Party. How do you see the impact of the election for this year? Well, for local elections, I, I think definitely they could, they are expected to pick choices up some seats. Mm -hmm. from different parties. Uh, but for the head of the uh, local executives, probably it's going to be very difficult because it's hardly uh, competed. Yeah. Uh, so for the third party, it would be hard to uh, take the mayor or magistrate's seat. But for councilmen, uh, and and uh, and uh, multiple seats, yeah. uh, elections they can pick up some. I do not see a fundamental shift well, of the political sure. map, right? Uh, yes, have in some way. Opinion. But the thing is, you know, <laughs> according to surveys, you know, conducted by various agencies, yeah. you can find out that the Taiwan People's Party is, you know, picking up their momentum, and in some cases, sometimes. Their approval rating is higher than the KMT's approval rating. Okay. And our party continues to be the number one party in Taiwan's political map. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, uh, this kind of third party uh, has become very critical in terms of this kind of three-way race, especially in some oh, yeah. cities. Yeah. For instance, in Taipei City, yeah. in Xinjou City. Yes. So I don't rule out the possibility that they could win in some places, even in uh, city uh, mayor or even uh, township, you know, chiefs and so on. Yeah. But overall, uh, it's, it doesn't affect the national balance of power in terms of uh, uh, the legislature yuan and so on. Right, right. So we won't underestimate uh, this kind of uh, uh, rising power. In, in of terms of this rising power, do you see it more as maybe pulling votes from the KMT more, or do you see it pull votes from the DPP as well? How, how do you see that balance? Well, if you look at the uh, surveys, you will find out that uh, so far uh, we have made some, our party continues to make some progress in terms of uh, gaining people's support. And KMT has lost some of the support to the Taiwan People's Party. So I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, the Taiwan People's Party has gained more support is because they have Wu and won uh, some of the support that traditionally are KMT supporters. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's the nature of this election, that it's the um, local elections that perhaps the parties, the choices from the people could be very di diversified. Yep. So actually, you have uh, brought up some news from the Washington, D.C. that you'd love to share with sure. us. Sure, a bit more from D.C. Yes. So speaking of winning strategies, 
I spoke earlier with Eric Huang at the KMT mission in Washington, D.C. He shared with me what he believes is the KMT strategy in balancing between the two world superpowers. Let's have a look. The semiconductor industry, uh, privately, I have spoken to a lot of their representatives. I think they'll applaud KMT's effort of keeping the open line of communication. For business people, obviously, they want to mitigate risk in any shape or form. Uh, this, even in this country, the United States, there is a debate between the Wall Street and Washington folks, right? They have different stance towards how people should approach China, right? Uh, so I think the current administration, uh, people, uh, I read this from the news, I don't have any inside stories, but at least from public information, the Biden administration uh, was a little concerned about some elements of Taiwan policy act, which Title I was taking out, right? The, the more political, uh, changing the name of our uh, tech bureau office and uh, giving Taiwan non-NATO uh, status, ally status, which I believe there are other elements in US policy that Taiwan already kind of enjoyed that status. But so I think, you know, even the administration don't want to be too provocative was Beijing, right? Uh, so I think KMT fits right in there, right? We are tough in terms of what we believe in, but we are also keep the opportunity open in terms of open line communication, right? So we are pragmatic. At the same time, we have a very realistic view of what's happening. Taiwan, unfortunately, so Taiwan is not a small country. We are in turn of international relations and middle of power. But between China and the United States in this triangle, we are a small country, right? So it's hard for us to carry a big stick, but we want to carry a stick, but we want to speak softly, as Roosevelt said, right? So I think, again, through Taiwan Policy Act, hopefully we can build a bigger stick and whatever without using Eric, what do you see the KMT office in Washington do in terms of preparing or is connecting with U.S. lawmakers or people in the political sphere in preparation for U.S. policy um, in regards to the elections in Taiwan, the local elections in 2022? People here really care about Taiwan and they want to know what's going on. I share my two cents with them of what's going on, atmosphere in Taiwan or how the election might swing each way, right? So I'm, uh, I, I do serve in that role. I explain to a lot of folks what I see and what they should pay attention to. So our representative office here, um, even though we represent KMT, the party, but I, I believe through us, we can do also some diplomacy, people to people's diplomacy. So our, our office not only represents KMT, but through that, to a larger extent, we want to represent Taiwan's people as well. Do you feel that U.S. policy or Taiwan's policy towards the U.S. will change if the KMT wins um, or is victoriously um, out of the elections this year? Well, this is um, this is a two-way street. Um, I don't think the local election will have as much impact, but 2024, especially both of our nations, Taiwan first, followed by the United States will have a presidential election. So um, I won't be surprised if there are any policy changes, but I, the most important thing is Taiwan and the United States will, have, will work in sync in cooperation, and I believe that will always be the case. That was Eric Huang of the KMT mission in the US. Now we turn to the work of Eric's counterpart, Mike Fonte at the DPP mission in Washington. Let's take a look. Well, of course, we have in Taiwan the November elections, which are the local elections. And we've been trying to explain my job, our job, is to explain what the DPP's position is, what, why there are certain people being nominated, and the problems that the president has had with nominations in to, to whom, you know, in Taiwan. Uh, we try to assure people that the real question is the overall vote in the, in the country. Yes, the Taiwan, the DPP may or may not lose Taiwan but they may or may not win Taipei. How does that balance itself out? And what's the larger picture? What is, what is the election 
So that's part of what we try to discuss with people. I think more importantly is what's going to happen in 2024, because there is this concern, Biden administration, the Congress is generally very, very happy with where President Tsai has positioned Taiwan, where the DPP under President Tsai as the chair has gone with its, with its policies. Uh, they want to see that continue. And so uh, then the question is, who are the candidates, who are the potential candidates for president? Obviously, the vice president Lai is the most important, uh, most visible and probably most probable nominee. Uh, what's his policy going to be? You know, he said this, we are, I'm a practitioner of Taiwan independence. You know, it's, ooh, what's that mean? Well, we try to explain what that means. It means he's practical. He's going to do the things that the independence people want to see done, but not overturn the apple cart and create and formally declare independence. It's part of the problem with formally declaring independence. What difference would it make? Is the United States then going to say, oh, you're independent now. Oh, we're going to recognize you. No, none of the Europeans will do, do that either, right? Just going to create more mafia, more trouble for, uh, I think. So, so I think part of it is to help people understand what the PPP position is, uh, what the, keep going back to the 99 resolution about we're already sovereign and independent. You want, you want to change that, you have to have a resolution. What I try to imp impress upon uh, American audiences is, you know, that position that we're, Taiwan's already sovereign and independent, if you want to change that, you have to have a prototype. means all options are open in the future, right? So I think I try to explain that's the position, right? And that's why for President Tsai, staying in the status quo, here's her version of the status quo. Now, different status quo uh, descriptions, right? Uh, for the United States, Taiwan's sovereignty is not determined yet. For DPP, yeah, it's determined. We're, and for the KMT, for that matter, it is a nation, right? Right. Republic of China. DPP Taiwan. puts Taiwan in parentheses. Uh, you know, and I know a lot of people in Taiwan want to be the Republic of Taiwan. Well, again, how do you how do you finesse the feelings of the electorate and also meet the problems that you would have in terms of U.S. China relations and therefore Taiwan China relations? So you don't really see a substantial change in terms of U.S. policy with, say, a KMT win or a DPP win. I think the United States is totally committed to rock solid support for Taiwan's democracy for Taiwan having the fresh air to be able to breathe its own air and continue to be a democracy, basically a free trade operation, basically a good, a good uh, responsive partner in the region. Um, so I don't, I don't see there would be a big shift if there's a Republic uh, PPP or KMT because that's the position of the United States. Now, you know, so, I think there's <clears throat> maybe some debate about whether a KMT position, whoever, depending on who their nominee is, what's that, what's that nominee's position going to be about cross-trade relations? So I think it's clear what the DPP's position is going to be, and that's part of what I try to explain to people. As mentioned by Mike, speaking of the U.S. rock-solid support, also, and the President Biden, for the first time since 1971, stated his Taiwan position at the UN General Assembly and mentioned on CBS 60 Minutes exclusive interview that the U.S. would send its armed force, men and women, to support Taiwan in the event of the Chinese invasion. Let's take a look. Taiwan makes their own judgments about their independence. We are not moving, we're not encouraging them being independent. We're not, let, that's their decision. But would U.S. forces defend the island? Yes, if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. So unlike Ukraine, to be clear, sir, U.S. forces, U.S. men and women, would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion? Yes. So, legislator, can I ask you this? Do you believe this is a sign of U.S. moving away from its strategic ambiguity? I think, uh, Political statements and rhetoric aside, I always believe that U.S. policy towards the Taiwan Strait has been very consistent. Mm -hmm. That is, to me, my reading is that it's not just a strategic ambiguity policy. It's a strategic clarity policy, but tactical ambiguity policy. In other words, if there's a war in the Taiwan Strait, the U.S. will definitely respond. But in terms of how to respond, with what means, I think the U.S. takes an ambiguous approach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think this kind of discussion is about strategic ambiguity, strategic clarity is somewhat misleading. Okay. You know, because according to the uh, Taiwan Relations Act, 
uh, what happens in the Taiwan Strait is a very great concern for the United States, especially uh, military invasion of Taiwan. So I do believe that the U.S. will respond uh, militarily, economically, or diplomatically. So we, I, I think, definitely will we expect some response from the United States. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to sending troops to Taiwan, I think there's a, a room of possibilities. In other words, they will either send troops to the grounds to help Taiwan, or they just send weapons to Taiwan, or there's all kinds of ways that the U.S. can come to the assistance of Taiwan. So again, it's a, a policy of ambiguity and courage. Right. So can I say this, uh, Director Huang? Is the U.S. strategy of strategic ambiguity in sovereignty, but strategic clarity in national security? Would you well, separate I, I would it not to frame discuss? As that. <laughs> okay. Um, I I would say you know basically what Chi Chen said uh, uh, is correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, whether it's ambiguity or clarity is not what we see it. The United States will choose the way or the approach to protect their own national interests. So I have a soundbite. I said the recent you know, discussion on Taiwan Policy Act is the most um, clear ambiguity. And what President Biden has said was the most ambiguous clarity. Mm -hmm. um, because I believe that President Biden spoke his mind and that the United States is committed to protect Taiwan's democracy. But uh, it is not up to the president to say that whether the troops should be deployed where. Uh, and uh, that, I call that flexibility okay. uh, and uh, necessary to protect American interests. It's, it's not an ironclad promise that, that the United States will send troops on the ground of Taiwan, because if we do not have joint training and joint exercise, how can we fight together, right? So we can work toward that objective, but we need time. That's why I think what the president expressed is the strong will of Washington and send a very strong message not only to Taiwan, but to Beijing and Tokyo and other allies. Mm -hmm. And that you mentioned United working towards that. Do you see that from our side, from the Taiwan side, to work more to make sure that the U.S. will come into Taiwan's assistance? Or do you see that more like the U.S. side coming to accommodate Taiwan in that sense? I would say that, uh, you know, I would agree with, uh, I, I hope that Chi Chen agree with me, that the United States policy had pretty consistent. Mm -hmm so far, you know, because, uh, you know, back in the TRA, uh, 1979, you know, the United States continue to express that, that they care about the mm. security environment and the benefit of the Taiwan people. And they will respond in, in accordance with their national interests. And what we need to do is to make sure that our national interest is overlapping with mm. the United States. And, and so they will do what we prefer, what they do, you know. So, so I'm, I'm not terribly worried about, you know, you know whether, you know, a clarity means a, you know, 100 percent, you know, military commitment. The United States will respond militarily, but where and how to deploy and use their force, it's up to the Indo-PACOM and the Joint Chiefs decision. Not ours. I think if there's a shift in the U.S. policy towards Taiwan from the so-called strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity, is the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Because before the war took place, the U.S. said clearly that they would not send their troops to the grounds of Ukraine to help Ukraine. So that, in some way, invited, I would say, invited Russia to invade Ukraine because Russia believed that. When they get in, they can get out, and the U.S. will have no way to respond. So in order to make sure that the same thing would not happen in the Taiwan Strait, in the Indo-Pacific, the U.S. has to send a signal to Beijing that we have the will to fight against any invasion from China to Taiwan. So sending that kind of will across the Taiwan Strait to Beijing is to make sure that they can deter the PRC from invading Taiwan in order to maintain peace and stability in the region. So you don't believe it's the argument 
that some people say, Taiwan is much more important to the U.S. than Ukraine is. So that is why President Biden's more willing to be more assertive in that sense. How, how would you say to that? Well, yes, Taiwan is very important, but I think it's very, uh, it's very difficult to compare the two countries, you know. But obviously, uh, Taiwan stands in a very important position in terms of geopolitical, geostrategic, geotechnological, geoeconomical uh, location. So I think Taiwan is very important. And I always believe that the, the only thing that could change the balance of power in the region overnight is Taiwan falling into the hands of China. So that could shift the bit of balance of power very easily, quickly. Uh, and then the U.S. Uh, will not be able to redress the imbalance if that imbalance happens. So it's very important to keep uh, this kind of balance of power in the region continued, but more importantly, to deter the PRC from taking any military action in the region. See, I would say that U.S. will for sure protect their national interests. That's for the very first thing, right? But legislator, legislator as Taiwanese, I'm curious about how would DPP still stand uh, balance in between the two giants, like U.S. and China? How would be the policy, the China policy, cross-strait policy towards to it? As we can see, the power and the punch get stronger, right? I, I don't think the term balance is the right word for Taiwan now. Okay. Because it's very difficult for us to balance the two countries. Mm -hmm. There's no way for a small country to balance the two countries. We're just in between. You know, but for us, we have to make sure that when we develop our security strategy, we all start with a definition about the threat and the sources of threat. And obviously, the, the most important challenge to our national security is the threat from China. Mm -hmm. So what we have been doing now is try to, 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 to how to deal with the threat, to cope with the challenge from China, posed by China. So in order to do that, we had to make sure that Taiwan has the credibility and the capability to deter the PRC from invading Taiwan. And like it or not, the U.S. is the country that is helping Taiwan to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. So U.S. is a natural ally of Taiwan. And unfortunately, China is the threat to Taiwan. So uh, yes, it's OK to say that we want to balance the two. But don't be misled by the fact that the nature of our relationship between Taiwan and U.S., Taiwan and China are totally different. Agree. And it's actually very important for the parties to have their policies towards the two giants. So I'm curious for KMT, where is KMT standing in between the two giants? Well, no matter it's DPP or KMT, Taiwan stands in between of these two giants. Yes, it's a okay? nature. So it's a, it's a, we can engage in policy debates and voters can make their choice. Uh, KMT's position is that um, we need to deal with issues, you know, how to strengthen our overall defense capacity and capability. But on the other hand, how can we mitigate the threat and reduce the probability of uh, crisis? Uh, what current now, I, I mean, you know, it may be difficult for international audience to understand, you know, the, all the details and the history of between Taiwan and the mainland. Um, but the fact is that KMT is able to maintain communication channels. What people would say that, oh, China is the enemy, so we don't talk to them. Uh, but I would say that from the Berlin crisis, from the Cuban crisis, uh, all the way to uh, the Vietnam War, um, conflicting or even warring parties maintain their communication channels open. Um, you know, for anybody who questions about uh, the, the ability to communicate uh, with Beijing, I would say that the communication is to reduce tension, is not to find a eternal settlement of political differences across the Taiwan Strait, because we weren't able to do that in the past 73 years. And uh, personally, I think it's the work of God, and uh, we should not take the God's job ourselves. So I would say that uh, the, the center point is to protect Taiwan's interests, the security and uh, prosperity of Taiwan people. How to do it? We get closer with the United States, 
because the United States is the only country that will continue to provide defensive articles and services to Taiwan and uh, had the commitment to help Taiwan. On the other hand, we have more than one million Taiwan citizens living on the other side who contributed to Taiwan's trade surplus uh, annually. So we need to be able to deal with our biggest challenger in order to protect our overall interests. That's our position. Okay. How do you what? see with um, Andrew Xie going to Beijing right after the um, military exercises? Do you think that actually enables more communication between the two sides? Or? Two key points. Uh, number one, uh, you don't find a good timing to visit uh, because we have elections coming up. You know, there were many political events. Uh, Andrew Shah did not, my vice chairman did not go to Beijing. Uh, the very original plan was to visit the Taiwan investors, Taiwan business community, Taiwan students over there. As I said, more than one million. So his visit was concentrated on the Yangtze River Delta, the Shanghai area, Zhejiang, and the Pearl River Delta, that's uh, the Shenzhen and Guangzhou area. So basically the theme was to um, go there, visit the business uh, association communities. Because of COVID, we, we, we haven't been able to see each other for a long time. And people, especially in international community, could not imagine that given so many Taiwanese over there as businessmen, as investors, as students, only one flight per week in Shanghai mm -hmm. to go back and forth. So, so a lot of uh, backlog, a lot of people tried to come back and wasn't able to. So we sent a delegation there to listen to their problem and uh, take it back. So I would call Andrew Shah's visit a fact-finding trip. That's it, not a political negotiation trip. More fact-finding for helping Taiwan. For helping in China. our <laughs> communities. Yeah. But, but I have to say that uh, yeah, it's 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 very difficult to find a good timing to visit mm -hmm. China. But I know the bad timing. Yeah. of visiting China, especially after China conducting these kind of lifestyle uh, um, drills mm -hmm. uh, near the territorial waters of Taiwan. Because it sent a very uh, uh, confusing or even wrong signal uh, uh, to the international community that some people or even the biggest political party, uh, opposition party in Taiwan is standing uh, with uh, the CCP. You know, I have to say that you know, that's what China wants. In other words, there are some people in Taiwan endorsing PRC's military exercise uh, near Taiwan. And we know that uh, all democracies are, were condemning China for undermining the stability in the region in the wake of these military drills. So on that, in that particular timing, uh, the KNT pay a visit, sent a delegation to visit China. I think that sent a very wrong signal. And we uh, send our anger to their face, <laughs> not through <laughs> keyboards. Well, <laughs> under the table, not, not in, okay. in public. We issue a press statement, you know, because I do not want to reveal too much, but I know the fact that um, during our dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, though the PRC sent um, uh, the ARATS uh, chairman to uh, Hangzhou to meet, and uh, we said we, we wanted to express and we will issue a press statement after the meeting that we express our anger and displeasure about the military drill How is surrounding reaction? Taiwan. They asked us not to issue the press statement and we say we must or otherwise we will be forced to stay in mainland and, and because <laughs> Taiwan will no longer <laughs> Welcome <laughs> us. So uh, without, you know, officially making. We we said you can issue your press statement, but we will do that, mm -hmm. and we did. Uh, so I have to say that that in dealing with China is not a easy business, uh, especially when you meet with your adversary. Mm -hmm. You gotta have a very strong position, very firm mind and say it face to face, and that's what we did.
Well, I think there are all kinds of adversaries or opponents. And in terms of how to deal with those different types of adversaries, you have to find out what their eventual goals are. And China's goal is very clear. That is to annex Taiwan eventually, uh, force, uh, with a peaceful means or uh, without renouncing the use of force. Mm -hmm. So that, if that's their eventual goal, and then it's very, very difficult for us to come to with China with that kind of uh, terms. So again, uh, the nature of our relationship is very difficult because it's a zero-sum uh, relationship between Taiwan and China. Yeah. Yes, we are still investing in China, but we have to diversify our investments because we, we don't want to put all eggs in one basket because that would be very dangerous. This year is kind of interesting, can you see, Rats, that we are actually talking about 9-1 local election, like as midterm, but ha still we need to discuss the U.S., the force, and also the China's intimidation issue. I think this year could be tricky than different. But as we've seen from our experience that China intensified its intimidation campaign before Taiwan's major election, do you believe that this could end up with some backfire this year to the election in general speaking? Well, again, if we walk back to the, you know, professor of political science, sure. I mean, local elections it involves, you know, uh, issues other than national security. So, so as we discussed, you know, personality, charming of a candidate, and some local affairs may still pay, play a role in people's voting behavior. Mm -hmm. Of course, China had learned their own lessons, right? The more they intimidate uh, uh, Taiwan, the more, uh, you know, Taiwan voters will re react. And they learned that in the hard way already. And uh, I don't know whether they uh, would turn smarter this time. But, uh, but I think, uh, you know, com in comparative terms, that, you know, you know China's behavior and intimidation would have a bigger impact on national election uh, compared to local. Their domestic audience. Oh, because in national election, you must talk about national defense, you talk about foreign policy and cross strait issues. Mm -hmm. But for locals, uh, that's not the key uh, for people to vote. Yeah. So far, I don't think China has become a factor in the local election this time. Okay. But we don't know, because in the past, they have the uh, experience of sanctioning Taiwan's agricultural sectors or sanctioning, exactly. sanctioning Taiwan's uh, tourism industries and so on in order to influence the electoral outcomes. So we don't know, but uh, still two months to go. We'll just wait and see. Yeah. Great. So we would now like to move on to the discussion on how events around the world impact local elections here in Taiwan and vice versa. Director, you just mentioned the advantages of the KMT is being able to open, have this line of communication with China. Um, how does the KMT balance with its um, more, say, China-friendly candidates, say, as we've seen in past elections? Yeah, you know, I don't want to, you know, this is not the issue today. I think, you know, I was in the Foreign Service. Uh, I don't want to say that, but it's more than 25 years ago. We confront that issue already because for most of the international readership and uh, viewers, it's very hard to understand how uh, the complexity of cross-strait relations. So the, uh, our friends in foreign press, they would you know, do it easily saying this is a pro-China or pro-US uh, or Taiwan friendly or China friendly. Uh, so they wanted to help their readership. Uh, but, but KMT had been a victim to be mislabeled uh, or oversimplified, labeled uh, as a, a taking a position like China. But so you mentioned earlier moderate candidates. Is, is that what you mean by? No, no, no. I, I think moderate candidate is more on their personality mm -hmm. or their ways in China dealing States. with public policy, mm -hmm. not China. U.S. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, because, um, you know, for a lot of people like me, I have, you know, visited China in the past 31 years. And, and I think all my friends in China understand that, oh, oh, Alex is coming because I've been always tough. And I told them 
that you never see I bend my spine, okay? So it depends on how you deal with them. The issue is to protect Taiwan's interests, uh, to make clear that they understand our position. Uh, you know, there, there are difficult times and there are good times. You know, China wanted to annex Taiwan since day one, 73 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, but we have change of government in the past 20 years. What I want to say is that people go to voting booths to gauge three values, you know, dignity, security, and prosperity. So when they care more about dignity, they will you know, have the biggest influence on their voting behavior. When they care about prosperity or money, dollar and cents, that will be another one. What we are worried about is that next general national election, whether they will not vote for dignity or prosperity, but security. Because security had always in the middle, but we, we don't know whether this time will be a larger or, or bigger issue for Taiwan people, given the Ukraine issue, given the Chinese exercise encircling Taiwan. We don't like it. Uh, and um, I think people are vigilant. I think all p politicians and political parties are working together to, to, to protect our national interests. And, and there are some commonalities, especially in terms of national security. I think we don't see much difference across party lines. It's the, the difference is how to, to what extent or through what approach that we will do it differently. Do you feel that it's going to intensify um, Chinese military aggression before the elections is, even though it's a local Oh, I mean this year? This year. Well, I hope they don't have such kind of collective but stupidity. But they, they, they just conducted uh, military drills in August, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, that's uh, immediate reaction to uh, Speaker Pelosi. And I think that all people on Capitol Hill, no matter uh, which party, or, or whether their personal relationship with Nancy, uh, all react strongly because that's a direct, you know, uh, reaction to the American Congress. Uh, I think Beijing should understand that. You know, it's not only intimidation of Taiwan voters. It, it, you, you also touch the nerves of the American elected mm -hmm. uh, officials. And what's worse, uh, Beijing uh, breaklist speaker Pelosi yeah. and her family members. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's very, I think uh, it's quite, yeah, it's, it's, it's an intimidation, but I, it's counterproductive. And I think Taiwan's general public's response or attitudes to China is a function of China's policy towards Taiwan. And if Taiwan is indeed drifting away from China, mm -hmm. I think that has to do with China's, this kind of uh, intimidation and, and isolation of Taiwan. So, you know, probably China should modify its policy towards Taiwan. Otherwise, Taiwan will continue to drift away, drift away from the mainland. Is that why you see increased U.S. support as well, because of China's increased support? Well, I think, China, I think uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was just an excuse used by Beijing yeah. to conduct these kind of drills in the territorial waters of Taiwan. I think China has already decided to expand its military power regardless of what happens in the Taiwan Strait. Because China has decided to, to move away from this kind of continental mentality to become a maritime power. Mm -hmm. So Taiwan stands in the way of China becoming a true maritime power. So, you know, this kind of argument about Taiwan is a part of China, you know, nationalistic sentiment and so on, are just, to me, are just excuses used by China and to prevent other countries from getting involved in China's internal affairs. But, you know, uh, the nature of this kind of expansion reflects China's true intention as becoming a maritime power. So Taiwan stands in the way of China's strategic expansion. But strategically speaking, are we waiting for the timing at the end of the October after the CCP's 20th Congress? Some commentary comments say that's like a pressure pot that Beijing is still waiting for the timing. They are preparing something. Do you agree with this 
have a say? Well, as we talk about whether China will do something stupid uh, before the time of selection, I think for now China is busy with its own domestic problems. Right. You know, they are trying to make sure that everything goes smoothly, mm -hmm. you know, before and after the second, the 20th, 20th yes. Party Congress. So we are hopeful that uh, China will not take any reckless action uh, before or in the wake of this uh, 20th Party Congress. And, but there are concerns about what after that, right. you know, especially if Xi Jinping find out that his power is further consolidated. And if he becomes so confident or overconfident uh, that uh, he could do whatever he wants to do. So there's a high risk of uh, Xi Jinping taking more you know, aggressive action in the region. Because as we talk about the local election, people are actually cares more about elections in two years, our presidential election in 2024. That's the focus, right? So what do you think the results this year would affect for the election in two years? I Cons think, uh, considering the two giants in every aspect. I don't think it would change the balance of power, of political power in Taiwan uh, uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. But it will affect the momentum you know, uh, let's just like 2018 and so on. So it will affect, because we are going to have an election right away, yeah. you know, uh, in early uh, 2024. So in about one and one, one half, half year. Right. So it's very difficult to reverse the momentum unless there is something dramatic happen, just like what happened in Hong Kong in 2019. So the momentum is very important. After the election, we have to see whether the momentum is against us or, you know, in our favor. What do you think? Director Huang. You know, uh, you have, it you seems know, like you have something to say. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for, for international viewers, uh, you have to listen to uh, uh, legislator law because the political calendar is right there. Yeah. Okay, the, uh, the, the, the winners of the local election will swear in on Christmas Day yeah. this year. And that's only like 13 or 14 months away from the presidential election which means that the primary would be next spring. It's coming up. So, so for Taiwan po, you know, political environment from today all the way through January 2024, we will be in a fully mobilized political you know, environment. And, and so China can take uh, you know, advantage over that, uh, of course. The uh, United States can weigh in their influence as well. So that, keeping that uh, in mind is that we also witnessed that uh, Xi Jinping or the Chinese Communist Party uh, is further consolidated and uh, they are not shy, uh, shying away from showing their strength or teeth. Uh, so we need to be very vigilant uh, because this is a long game. You know, if we, we will try, we should try not to make the game shorter. It would not be in our benefit because, because we have a, you know, long-term plan to develop our economy. We, we, have, we need time to boost up our defense. We need time to wait the U.S. arms sales items to arrive and train them. So to the best benefit is that we need to inform our voters and citizens and also the international viewers that time is our friend. And we do not push issues uh, unnecessarily uh, because um, you know, the, we cannot predict what China would do after the party Congress when Xi Jinping got the third term. Mm -hmm. So to be cautious that we need to keep in mind that our interest is the number one and, and we should do whatever to our interest. And Would you think that say, if there was a win for either party, would that diffuse tensions with China in some way to delay that day that you mentioned? Well, I, I'm not that romantic. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter if it's a DPP win or a KMT win, I think, as Chi Chen said, that they set their goal. They are going to do it. So, so I, I think China may read the result of a local election and make their own conclusion. But I think the top leadership in Beijing, they will do whatever they want to do 
whatsoever. And that's my point. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the national election in January may change a little bit, mm -hmm. but not this time, not local election this year. Well, I think uh, that touches upon a very important question that we've been asking ourselves. That is, is time on our side mm -hmm. or on China's side? And I agree with uh, what Eric, Alex just said, that we try to prolong the process of the eventuality. But the thing is, China has been pushing the envelope. Yeah. China has been challenging or changing the status quo. Mm -hmm. And people begin to talk about a new normal. Right. You know, China has been crossing the so-called medium line almost on a daily basis. Yeah. So if that happens and China will push Taiwan to the corner, that Taiwan had to respond whatever China uh, does. For instance, the recent drones flying over to of, of Taiwan's offshore islands, mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, undermine this, that's undermined the stability in the region. And Taiwan had to, had to respond by shooting down the drones. But that, in some way, escalated tension. So I think, uh, yes, we are hopeful that uh, the status quo can be kept for good. But the thing is, uh, the status quo has been challenged and changed. And China is changing the status quo on a daily basis. So what should we respond to that kind of challenges? So China has been taking this kind of salami approach in, in, in changing uh, Taiwan's situation, changing the Indo-Pacific security environment. So 